Thank you to Total Boat for supporting this video. My friend Duffy started a history museum, and every now and then I get the opportunity to contribute with some kind of woodworking task. In this case, Duffy acquired an original 24-pound howitzer cannon made in 1847, and of the original 69 produced in the mid-1800s, 36 of them are known to have survived, with only three of them, this is one of them, being in personal collections. The cannon itself, or the tube, it is original. The carriage it is sitting on is not. The previous owner said that he had it for 30 years and doesn't remember all of the history before him. Now there's a few original items like the axle and the double link chain, but all of the woodworking and some of the metal are reproductions. My task was to relocate the elevating gear, or in this case the screw. Rotating this screw changes the elevation of the rear of the cannon and therefore changes the firing angle. The carriage was originally made for a Napoleon 12-pounder, and the only difference between this carriage made for the Napoleon versus one that was made for the howitzer is about one and three quarters of an inch in length of the cheek plates and about two and three eighths difference in the location of the elevating screw. Other than that, they're basically the same thing. With the screw removed, you can see the size of the holes that need to be plugged. Before making any adjustments, I wanted to make sure that the original locations were well documented. Some masking tape was applied to both sides of the holes and then their locations were transferred to the tape with a pencil. The screw is threaded into a bronze nut at a very specific angle. And after measuring it a few different ways, I determined that 12 and a half degrees was the angle of choice. This angle will be used later to cut a guide block for starting the new holes. The main construction wood for these carriages is white oak. So that's what I'm going to use to plug the holes. And first up is to cut some turning blanks. Then the dowels can be turned, starting with the smaller dowels. I used an open-ended wrench as a guide to get the dowel to a uniform size, and then after that I reduced the diameter little by little to sneak up on a very, very snug fit, checking it between each reduction. After the small dowels, the larger dowel is turned, and for this one I turned it round and then reduced only one end for testing. With a test fit confirmed on the smaller end, the rest of the dowel was turned to that diameter. A little prep work was needed for the large hole. The screw was lubricated with grease, so some residual grease was on the inside of the hole. I used mineral spirits with a wire brush to give the inside a quick scrub to remove any loose debris. Fixoflex, flexible epoxy adhesive by Total Boat, is what I'm using to secure the dowels. Now, as the tube says, Total Boat Fixoflex provides for stronger bonds than adhesive sealants and with greater flexibility than regular epoxy. It's excellent for applications where bonds must withstand flexing, twisting, contraction and expansion, shock or vibration. And this carriage will experience literally every one of those forces. The tube also says it's ideal for damp or oily woods, which gives me a little better peace of mind regarding the large screw hole. Before I show myself struggling with the super cheap caulking gun, the only one that I had at the time of doing this project, let's jump into the future and show a test with a much more appropriate caulking gun. The blue gun that I'm using is a newborn DuraCore 18 to 1 thrust ratio, and the red gun is a generic medium duty caulking gun. The test is to squeeze out as much as possible in 30 seconds with the same tube and the same nozzle opening. And as you can see, the red generic medium duty gun does not provide much pushing force. I have to really struggle with this just to get a tiny amount to come out. The blue gun, on the other hand, it has a much higher thrust ratio and pushes more material out with a fraction of the effort. This is a perfect example of using the right tool for the task. Back to the project, and as I said, at this time all I had was the medium duty gun, so the struggle was definitely real with this one. After getting a bunch of thick sew into the hole, I applied a liberal amount to the side of the dowel and then spread it around with a piece of cardboard, and then drove it home with a mallet. The process is the same for the other two dowels, and one thing to note here is the grain direction on the dowels. I am gluing them in perpendicular to the grain on the carriage, Typically, you would not want to do this because they will expand and contract in a different direction than the rest of the carriage. However, the center section of this carriage is just two large white oak beams that have already been pinned together with bolts in various different directions anyway. I don't see an issue with these wooden pins or dowels in this exact situation. I let the Thixo epoxy cure overnight and then flush trim the dowels on top and bottom. 
The large hole still needs a square plug to cover the bronze bushing mortise, but before that can be installed, I needed the top of the dowel to be parallel with the top surface of the carriage. To do that, I used a small trim router and a low angle spiral bit. All of this was done freehand to just nibble away the center dowel only. Next, I cut a rectangular block of oak slightly larger than the original mortise and traced its location with a marking knife. Then the rounded mortise is chiseled into a more patch-friendly rectangle down to the same depth as the top of the dowel. You can see here that there is still a little bit of tapered mortise around the front side of the dowel. The options are to trim the dowel and mortise deeper to eliminate it or just fill it with the epoxy. Because it wasn't much space, I chose to fill it with the epoxy before seating the patch. I also let this sit overnight for the epoxy to set up before trimming it flush. Remember that 12 and a half degree measurement I took earlier? I used a few blocks on my drill press table to establish that angle into a guide block. With the elevation blocks on the right clamped in place, just one clamp is needed to keep the left edge of the guide block stuck into the T-track with downward pressure. This locked the angle while the hole was slowly and carefully drilled. And I know what a lot of you are gonna say, just tilt the table. Well, this setup was pretty easy and afterwards I don't have to worry about calibrating the table back to 90 degrees again. Back to the carriage for another quick fix. It dawned on me that the front dowel is the only one that will be exposed in the new position. And I was worried about the end grain of the dowel telegraphing through the paint. So I drilled a shallow hole with a forcema bit for another plug. This time the grain will be parallel with the rest of the wood and hopefully not telegraph through the paint. I don't have a one inch plug cutter, so I used the CNC machine to cut the plug. Because I wasn't worried about the glue dripping through and I needed to get back to work on this area immediately, I used a fast setting PVA glue. A hand plane was used to remove the bulk of the patch waste and then a few quick passes with a sander to make sure everything was flush. I couldn't complete the work with just the hand plane because there were too many bumps and irregularities in the surrounding wood. This cosmetic patch up front was right in the middle of the two main beams. And the crack you see isn't a crack, it's a seam from the two beams shrinking slightly over time. So I used a thin saw to cut a kerf into the new patch to make the seam look continuous. Once covered in paint, there shouldn't be any visual indications of a patch being here. Here's where the 12 and a half degree guide block comes into play. After carefully positioning it for the new holes, it was clamped securely to the carriage. Then we used the same digital angle gauge with some shims to get the top face to 12 and a half degrees from parallel with the floor. With the carriage at the correct angle, we can focus on keeping the drill vertical. And to do that, I had some help from Duffy. When looking down at a drill, I find it easy to keep the drill tracking vertical left to right, but as I'm standing over it, I can't really tell front to back. I clamped a level vertical to one of the wheels for Duffy to use as a visual reference. He could tell me to lean forward or to lean back to keep the drill tracking vertically while I was able to stay vertical left and right. The two and one eighth of an inch hole was drilled deep enough into the surface, just enough to remove the guide block. Then we used an overdrive bit to quickly hog out the center section. Now removing the center makes the Forstner bit much easier to drill with. Back and forth between the overdrive bit and the Forstner bit until we were all the way through. With the main hole drilled, the mortise for the bronze nut needed to be cut. Nothing fancy here, just some guide blocks for the sides and lots of chisel chopping. One thing to note, is the front of the mortise is rounded, so that part did take a bunch of back and forth testing to get it to fit right. Once the screw was fit, we knew the location of the two bolt holes, and they were drilled as deep as possible with overdrive bits, and then drilled all the way through with a long reach electrician's auger spade bit that I happen to have. I only have one of these bits, and it just happened to be the exact diameter I needed. At this point, all of the work in my shop is done and so it's just time for Duffy to take it home for the last minor repairs and a fresh paint job. I did send Duffy home with some penetrating epoxy to fill in any of the tiny cracks and cheeks that was in the wood and if you need epoxy to get deep into super tiny cracks this is definitely the stuff to get. It has an incredibly low viscosity. Also note that we will be firing this cannon in a later video, so be sure to subscribe so you don't miss that. And this is the size of the projectile. It's quite large. The hat is here for a size reference. 
Here it is on display in Duffy's museum with the original 24 pound howitzer cannon in place. The tube is stamped from Springfield, Massachusetts and made in 1847. And here you can see the correct location of the elevating screw. Before it was contacting the tube two and three eighths of an inch forward, not contacting the back ring like it should have been. Here's another look at the diameter of the tube and the size of the projectile. Duffy also has one original spike and a spike is used with a pair of rings at the end of the carriage to get a mechanical advantage to more easily move and position the carriage. And finally, the rare howitzer cannon is displayed with an even more rare 24 pound howitzer ammunition chest, which is the only known howitzer ammunition chest surviving to this day. If you'd like more information or would like to see Duffy's museum in person, check out his website, StarkvilleCivilWarArsenal.com, where you can find contact info and get in touch with Duffy to schedule a visit. Duffy does not charge an entry fee to get into his museum, although he does have a donation bucket by the door uh, to kind of help keep the lights on, as the saying goes. Uh, if you're interested in more of this history type content, I do have the Sweet Gum Mortar Video 1 and 2, where we fired a Sweet Gum Mortar. So much fun in both daytime and nighttime. We have the Rolling Forge video, an ammunition restoration chest video, and an ambulance uh, photo shoot that I did with Mr. Duffy. So lots of stuff on this particular topic. Go to my website, jacecustomcreations.com slash newsletter and sign up for my email newsletter so you don't miss anything that I publish. Thank you to Total Boat for supporting this video. You guys take care, have a great day, and I'll talk to you in the next video.